an article in Medscape titled Why are Germans getting heavier? But it really doesn't refer to Germans only. This is really for anyone following a Western diet. And the author, Uta Eppinger, I think she has some very good points here. I think a few things are missing, especially about the composition of the foods, you know, what, what's changed in terms of uh, uh, the ingredients that we're eating. But she makes very good points about eating patterns, which I think are hugely important to understand why we are a lot heavier today. Because when you look back to the 1940s, 50s, 60s, people were significantly thinner than today and healthier. Um, the um, obesity phenomenon really increased dramatically over the last, you know, uh, 50 years or so. But so they start out here talking about some of the patterns here. They um, start off with spice, in interviews saying Germans have a very high energy intake. Sure, but it goes for anyone really. Um, but, you know, the average weight of the population can also increase if energy intake remains the same, but energy expenditure decreases. So, of course, the point is being less physically active while eating the same calories can certainly increase your weight. And this is sort of the, you know, calories in, calories out theory, which, you know, of course, has some merit. But this is just one of the points that they're scratching on. But they're going to go into some more detail about the specific patterns here. Um, they're saying in the past 40 years, every um, everyday energy expenditure has decreased significantly. And they write this off to, you know, us using transportation instead of walking, you know, kind of using machines to do uh, everyday activities. So there's less activity in our everyday living. I would certainly agree with that. That's just a small part, though, I think. So the... They're saying further here that the constant oversupply of food um, also plays a role, of course. Many people not only eat uh, the three meals a day, but also have developed the habit of snacking throughout the day. And I think this is a very good point. This is where this article becomes interesting because the snacking is something where we lose track. We lose track of the calories we're putting in our bodies, but also satiety. Because when you snack, you don't really get full, but you know you have a constant supply of, of calories and you don't ever really stop eating. When you have a meal that you sit down and you focus on your meal and you consume your meal, after the meal you should feel full and then you should not eat until your next meal, which should ideally be about three, three hours or longer after. So the idea of pattern, in my opinion, is having you know three meals a day and one snack in the form of a protein shake. And I talk about that frequently. Big breakfast, every meal prioritizes protein, of course. Then about three, uh, three hours later, you have your, your lunch. Then three hours later, protein shake in the afternoon, very important one because it makes you eat less for your dinner, which should be actually a very small meal later that is uh, free of carbohydrates, in my opinion. But so they're talking about snacking here, and they're saying that this trend towards not really sitting down for a meal is something that we can observe in statistics. They say, in 2008, uh, the people that would sit down for a warm meal, a hot meal, they say here, was 55%. 10 years later, it was 45%. So there's a significant decrease there. And warm meal, again, Part of this pattern of having fixed meals, meals that actually fill you up where you sit down, you eat until you're full, and then you don't have food until your next meal, right? And that's somewhat, somewhat decreasing. The trend is to just snack throughout the day, which is not a bad pattern, apparently, because obviously it's not doing well for us. So the next point the author makes is that satiety signals are often overlooked. And I think that's a very important point that relates to snacking. They're right here. The problem with snacking is that it typically happens on the side. If you don't focus on the food itself while eating, but do other things at the same time, the likelihood is high that you will overlook internal signals of hunger and satiety. Then external signals play a role. So this is like, you know, sometimes, you know, again, it, external signals would be like uh, you're sitting down and eating your meals at a scheduled time, which is, which is a good thing, unless you're snacking in between. So you're snacking the whole time and you're kind of really not hungry, but then, hey, it's lunchtime. And at lunchtime, what do you do? You, do, you sit down and eat. Normally, you wouldn't. You listen to your internal stimulus, and that's really what younger children and, and babies usually do. You know, they eat until they're full and then they stop. But we lose these um, internal uh, signals and replace them a lot of times with external signals. And that is actually a, a quite a big mistake here. So, do you basically then, as they write here, consume more cal calories overall? Again, debatable because when you think back to the 1940s, uh, what they did, they did a starvation study, the Minnesota starvation study, where they, you know, saw what people, how people would behave if food was drastically reduced. You know, they kind of wanted to study what would happen in like a famine. And the interesting thing was initially they determined how much does an average person actually eat. And it was something like 3,500 calories for an average man. This was in 1944, I believe. Now think about that uh, today. I mean, you know, if that's, more calories, a lot more than, than I'm eating. If I ate 3,500 calories every day, I would uh, gain a lot of body fat. But back then they were thin. 
um, again, they had more scheduled eating times. They were more physically active. I would say also during their work on average, they would ride their bike more, they would walk more, and they would have some physical um, activity a lot of times at their work, more likely than today, where today, again, machines are taken over things that back then were done by hand. Let's put it that way. They were also a lot more outside in general. But again, 3,500 calories is, is, is quite a bit. So it's not the point to say just, oh, we're just eating more calories today, I think is incorrect. So the first point, again, less exercise. Yes, absolutely. And then snacking is an issue and overlooking this internal stimulus, right? So the snacks themselves often are high in calories. So it means that the snacks we're eating are not very good. It's rarely an apple or banana, but rather a pastry from the bakery. So processed foods. They don't really talk about processed foods in this article, but I think it's an important point <clears throat> to bring up because the composition of our foods has changed. We're eating more processed foods, we're eating foods high in seed oils, high in fructose corn syrup. And that is very different from what they ate back then. You know, they did not have seed oils. You know, they ate lard and uh, beef tallow and butter and olive oil. And they also ate sugar. They didn't eat high fructose corn syrup. And these behave very differently. And then when you have processed foods that have a ton of calories, these calories a lot of times behave differently in the way that we digest them and use them, right? So the next point the author talks about is stimulus response. Um, they're saying here, nutrition research indicates that patients with obesity react more strongly to external stimuli and have a disrupted feeling of satiety. I talked about that just before for just a bit. So again, babies uh, eat and drink entirely according to internal stimuli and they stop when they're full. But then this is a lot of times replaced by external stimuli. And that is actually counterproductive because the external stimuli is again, the plate is full or the food is there. So you eat the food, whether you're hungry or not. And that is actually a mistake. So you, you should allow the time between your meals and then at your meals, you should be a little bit, of, a little bit hungry at the end of your meal, you should not be hungry. And then, you know, you listen to this internal signal rather than to external stimuli here, right? And that's really what they mean by that here. So additional factors um, are significant as well here. They're saying the constant willful counteracting of internal signals of hunger and satiety. Many have had literal diet careers and have completely unlearned to listen to the internal signals because they constantly sorry, they constantly counteracted them. So again, this is like a willful change in the internal stimuli that we should be listening to and replacing them by external uh, feeding signals, which is not a good idea, obviously, because this is uh, very counterproductive to our calorie intake. So um, we need to be able to, um, according to the author here, control food decisions, including the flexibility to let things some, uh, slide sometimes. So if you're not hungry, don't have the meal, in other words. Um, and a very important point they're making here is this one. Patients who are healthy and slim, even without following restrictions, are doing other things right, um, said the author here. Um, exercise and sports not only directly increase energy expenditure, but also have an influence on internal hunger and satiety regulation. And that's an additional benefit. So that's actually very true. So when you when you exercise, when you, when you go outside, you do sports. Well, first of all, you have a set period of time where you don't eat because you don't. You don't eat while you're exercising, obviously. But besides that, this can help with the internal stimulus because, you know, what happens usually after you exercise, right after, you might not be hungry, that, but then within an hour, you're very hungry. And then you listen to the stimulus and then you have your meal. And it helps to regulate that. If we don't exercise, if we're sedentary all day long, we're in the state where we can just constantly eat or snack without ever really feeling full and then still have the meals on top of that. And our energy expenditure is very low. We're not very active and we're dysregulated. And then we have these external stimuli that contribute to it, uh, you know, additional calories coming in that we really don't have to have, right? Now they talk then about like how to help and what behavioral therapy and all that. Again, I think uh, you don't need to go to therapy necessarily to help with your eating patterns. I think understanding this and having a structure where you do allow, as I mentioned before, time between meals saying, hey, I have X amount of meals and X amount of time. I think uh, for most people, we should have all our meals within about a 10 hour eating window. And I think that's working quite well. In the 10 hour eating window, again, three uh, main meals and one snack, I would say ideally in the form of a protein shake between lunch and dinner, but no snacking in between. And then um, having 14 hours of a fasting period overnight. And I think that works well for most people. Now there are some people that do well with two meals a day, absolutely fine. I think it's sometimes hard to get sufficient amounts of protein in them. 
The other thing is, which I don't talk about in this article, like the composition of your foods. And to make it simple, as I mentioned before, prioritize protein. That means usually if you start out with saying, hey, how much protein do I want to eat throughout the day? And a rough um, you know, formula here, if you're healthy, so of course, if you have any kidney disease or other issues, then you should talk to your physician about how much protein you can take in. But for a healthy person, 0 0.8 to 1 gram per pound per day. So for me, I weigh about 180 pounds. I'm eating about 180 grams of protein a day. And I usually uh, select it in the morning. I'm saying, well, I'm going to have five pounds of chicken breast. I'm going to have four eggs. I'm going to have some Greek yogurt uh, and so on. And then I'm going to have about uh, 80 to 100 grams of protein in terms of a protein shake. And I usually mix a whey protein isolate with a pea protein. So I have two different types of protein powder in there. I put some berries in there. I put some, some milk and some flax seeds in there. So I make this really more like a meal shake, one in the morning and then one between my lunch and my dinner, right? Planning out your day with your protein in mind like that and then adding in as little as you can get away with to make your meals taste somewhat good, your carbohydrates and your fats is a, a fairly good solution to designing your daily schedule. Um, again, you should not eat when you're not hungry at all, but having a schedule initially is somewhat helpful because you then have your, your breakfast, your lunch, your protein shake, and your dinner at certain times. You're not skipping, you're not getting too hungry, and you're not snacking in between. Again, like these are very important patterns. So initially, I think having a schedule, a set time when, when you do this, scheduling exercise in between, scheduling walking time is super helpful to start losing body fat actually very well while keeping muscle mass. And that's actually a very important point. Keep your muscle mass, lose the fat. Muscle mass is extremely important. And as we get older, we lose more muscle. So it's very important to keep that, right? So talking about like how to correct this and all this stuff, I think that's, again, a, a bit far here. But this is very analytical. This is a, uh, a, from a university in Germany. They talk about then obesity prevention, which I think is very important, especially with children. So the authors say here, um, good infrastructure for uh, pedestrian and cycling path uh, would be part of successful obesity prevention. So again, being more active, walking, riding your bike rather than taking your car. Makes sense, right? Um, and they're promoting sort of these things, um, limiting screen time and taking steps to address the sedentary lifestyle, of course. Standing, walking, moving around, all of this is better for weight and health than sitting. Of course, you know, again, avoiding... Uh, sitting on your butt all day and not uh, expending any calories, right? In terms of nutrition, they're talking about that a little bit here, reduce calorie consumption, sure, to some extent, but again, don't be in this calorie prison. Uh, change the type of calories you're consuming, focus on protein, reduce carbohydrates and fats as you can, and have breaks in between your meals, of course, right? Liquid calories, and this is an important point they're bringing up right now, are very problematic. This has not yet been understood by everyone. Very importantly here, so they're saying in sodas, juices, and alcoholic drinks, uh, there are many liquid calories in them that hardly make you feel full. Very true. You can consume a lot of calories in liquids. You can drink a lot of calories without really feeling full. Think of sodas. Uh, think of these uh, uh, shakes or, or milkshakes you can get at some places. They, are, they have a ton of calories in there. So they're saying here from 500 to 1,000 calories a day can accumulate through the consumption of such drinks. I, could, I think it could even be more than that, actually which is often overlooked. So point of this is don't drink things with a lot of calories. It doesn't make a lot of sense unless it's your protein shake, but that shouldn't have a ton of calories. Now, sodas and fruit juices and, and all these drinks that you get and smoothies, I would really avoid. Fruit juices have a lot of sugar. Smoothies usually have a lot of fruit, otherwise they taste disgusting. If you just drink celery juice, I, I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't think there's a lot of benefits there, but if you like that, that's probably fine. Um, but most drinks will have a sugary part in them and that will have a ton of calories. There might be some fat in there as well. So for young children, another point here they're making, um, it is uh, particularly important that the eating situation be uh, pleasant and appreciated by children. Then the children find they serve food uh, great and delicious and they also it, uh, that also changes children's preferences. So Starting young is important here is what they really mean. You know, if you start with good eating patterns and good foods, the risk of childhood obesity and with that adolescence and adult obesity significantly decreases, of course. So again, I like the article. I like the idea to do, discuss these eating patterns that are problematic, um, to understand that snacking in between meals is a problem, to not consume our calories in liquid form, 
to increase um, our energy expenditure in terms of exercise by walking, riding the bike and all that. I think this is actually very helpful. Um, and then of course, what's a bit missing here is the composition of foods. Again, as I mentioned before, prioritize protein, make those changes. And I think that could be very helpful. So again, great article. It's not just the Germans that are getting heavier or, or fatter, but, but of course everybody else, including us Americans here. Interestingly, for a little while, I forgot when it was, but for a little while, Germany was more obese as a nation than the US. But we couldn't let Germany beat us here. So, of course, we wanted to be number one again. And uh, we are now officially number one in obesity in the US again. So congratulations to us. Something we have to work on. But again, all Western <coughs> societies that are eating this sort of um, processed food, snacking pattern, sedentary lifestyle have issues. This article addressed some of this. I think it was very well written. And again, Medscape is an interesting uh, forum. <clears throat> you know, you can access this, uh, medscape.com. I think this is something that um, is very uh, educational for a lot of people. And they go a bit, in a bit more detail than a health article would that's published in a non-medical uh, journal or online forum. So sometimes you get very good information here. So I hope this was helpful. Um, please subscribe and um, leave a comment. I definitely will read those. And I'm especially interested in the dietary pattern changes that you may have made that had an impact on your body fat percentage. Something that has worked for you, that a pattern that you changed that had a result. So I'd love to hear that and uh, talk to you in the next video.